for every idea that you come up with, how many of them are what you consider bad ideas and you throw them away? Well, I, I, I feel like I never really throw an idea away. Um, an idea will either be just not ready yet um, or it's, it's not enough to be its own thing. I'm going to have to put this aside and this might be a piece of something else later on. Um, you know, there's just a, tons of ideas that you, you, you work out in your head and you think, is that something? Is that, you know, could I? And then when it comes to the point where now I, I can't make that gel, I just, I just keep it somewhere in the back of my head, behind my left kidney somewhere. And, uh, you know, I'll be five years later, I'll be working on something and I'll just think, ah, oh, subplot, you know, ah, oh, villain, you know. And also, I must say, you know, I've been making a lot of short films now. And so it's been a great treasure trove for me to go back to some of these ideas that I tried to develop as feature films or a TV series. And I never could really figure out a way to sustain them for two hours or for five years. But they're still good, solid little ideas. And I thought, ah, this would be a great 10 minute little movie. And so I've had a lot of success in that way with just taking this, an idea from you know, 15 years ago uh, that now, and then of course, you know, you, you modernize it and, and uh, uh, you know, suddenly uh, breathe new life into it. So it's not just the same thing. But uh, ideas to me are gold and, and uh, I never really throw them away. <laughs> They're always there. So going back to your friend who, bless his heart, wanted to read these screenwriting books, but then said, well, what ideas do I come up with? Right. It sounds like for you, that's never been a problem. And in fact, there's so many. It's just how much time do I have? Yeah, it, it is frustrating. Uh, you know, there's so many things I want to do. Uh, you know, have an, I have a, an idea for a new novel. Um, but that's an incredible undertaking, you know, to write a novel. And, you know, scripts, I, I write scripts pretty quickly. Once I get the idea and I, I, I feel like it's formed, I can actually write the script pretty fast. But uh, it's frustrating because a novel, I know I've got to devote a year to that. And um, it's hard to put everything else aside, you know, to do that. But it's, it's a strong idea and I'm desperate to do it. So uh, there are, there's tons of ideas that, uh, and that's also where the short films help me because I can, I can develop them quickly, execute them quickly, and see them done in front of an audience, you know, fairly quickly. Um, but there, and I guess it's a good thing ultimately, but... It's frustrating that I just feel like I'll never be able to tell all the stories that I want to tell because, you know, we only live so long. Does it become easier to come up with good ideas the longer you're doing this, the longer you've been creative? I don't think so. Um, I don't think it gets easier or harder necessarily. Uh, the, you know, the question always is, you, know, you get an idea and then, you know, how to grow it. Uh, is it really strong enough to sustain an audience's interest, to be worthy of an audience giving two hours of their time to watch it, or an hour, whatever it is, uh, or 10 minutes, <laughs> in, in, in the case of my short films. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, it, to me it's always been, uh, yeah, the, the ideas come, but the, the forming of those ideas into a cohesive story is difficult and always has been, I think, probably for me, always will be. Uh, you know, I so envy these writers I know, um, showrunners I know, people like Stephen King, who seem to be able to just come up with an idea fully formed and just get out there and, and do it. And it's a much slower process for me, even though once the idea is formed, I can go very quickly. But it just takes a while for me to really get the depth I want and the complexity that I want in this story. And it's, it's the most difficult part of writing for me because it's really starting from nothing. And so I stand there at my desk and it's like the blinking cursor and I've got this basic idea, but now I've got to just create the beats, beat by beat by beat and what's going to happen. And it's horrible for me. It's a horrible process. It takes me a really long time. And um, my friends like it because I tend to be in touch with them a lot because, oh, I haven't spoken to Bill in a while. I better call Bill, uh, you know, rather than actually concentrating on his work. Um, but once I start to get the ideas and the ideas flow and I understand now, okay, this is what the story is. Here's the ending. Uh, here's the three acts. Uh, once that happens, then I can really kick into high gear. Then I really enjoy it because uh, now I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm working with. It's like having the frame of a house done rather than looking at a blank air 
and trying to figure out how you're going to build this house and what's going to hold the wood up and what's going to hold the roof up. And now the, the frame is there and now I can do the plumbing and electricity and I can get the siding on and, um, and put the windows in. Uh, and, and then it's fun for me. And then I just go really fast. I, I write scripts you know, really, really fast, the first drafts anyway. <laughs> and then it takes a long time to rewrite them as we spoke about earlier. And you stand when you write? I do, yes. I have a stand. Like yes. Hemingway? Did he stand? I yeah, thought I he did, him. yeah. Huh. I thought he did, but maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Ahead of his time. Yeah. Well, I mean, but you do get more energy standing. You know, I mean, yeah. that's the standing desk. It, it, yeah. it, when you sit, it, it really... I don't. I mean, there are times when you know, take a break and sit, but right, standing, right. you really the blood's flowing, and I've and, come to just love it, and I really rely on it now. And I find that if I'm really trying to puzzle out uh, a plot hole or something really spongy that I can't get, I will sometimes sit. And in my office at home, I'm lucky enough to have this like window seat, and so I'll just go sit there for a little while and try to think it think it through, and then I'll get something, and I'm back to the desk, and you know. But standing gives me a lot more energy, and, and uh, I really, really like it. I think you've said as a filmmaker, at times you've tended to feel a little bit in a vacuum with the creative process. Can you explain what well, that means? Well, yeah, I think it's always a, a bit of a danger um, to be, you, know, you get so caught up in the process of making a film, uh, and it, it consumes so much of your life, and your energy, and your relationships that you, know, you can become so focused on it that you're not open anymore to what's going on you know, around it. Um, and it's just, it's just a dangerous thing, and not only for the actual process of filmmaking, but just in your life as a filmmaker. And it's, again, something that, um, this is the second time I've mentioned Los Angeles in maybe not the best way, so I don't mean to be piling up on Los Angeles, but uh, during the time, like, I've lived out here, um, in various stages of my life. And what I've always felt at the times I've lived here is that the film business, show business, can just so easily take over all of your, uh, all of your senses. It's everywhere you look. You know, it's every billboard, everything you see around you. Everyone around you is writing a script. You go to Starbucks, there's 10,000 people there writing. Uh, in fact, one, uh, years ago, one news station... Um, put a reporter in front of the uh, Village Theater in Westwood. And everybody walked by and just said, how's your script coming? <laughs> <laughs> like, everybody. Oh, my third act. So, you know, I mean, everybody had an answer for that. So um, I do think that for me, the advantage of living in a place like New York is that I'm exposed, whether I like it or not, to every aspect of life, every other profession. You know, uh, where I live in New York, my neighbor is an engineer, Another neighbor is a lawyer. Um, a guy down the block is a plumber. And you know, they get a kick out of what I do, but they're not, like, overly impressed by it. You know, it's just like, it's, oh, yeah, that's fun. That must be fun. I don't know. Um, but it, it helps keep you grounded, I think, uh, and out of that vacuum because that's where creativity dies. And that's where I feel like you start to, in your storytelling, you start to reference things that are not real, things from show business or things from other movies or other TV. Uh, if you're not exposed enough to what's happening in life, uh, you know, you can be a little narrow, I think. You had mentioned old Hollywood and, and your love for that. There's a book about how Marilyn Monroe left L.A. for a while and went to New York. Oh, really? Yeah. And so they, they put a wig on her, a dark wig. They put her on a plane. I guess she, I don't know if she was out of her contract or she wanted out, but so things weren't good in Hollywood, so she wanted to go to New York and they took her to the closest place, which was Connecticut, which they thought was New York. But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so she stayed there, but then eventually made her way to New York City. And uh, for a brief time, just felt very uh, free and and was able to, you know, start working on projects. But then sadly, came back to L.A. But uh, Interesting. Interesting. Just, just wanted out of that same bubble. Yeah, yeah well, that's smart. It's a smart thing to do. And I think that's why many actors choose to live, if not in New York, but, but outside of Hollywood you know, whatever that means today. But, um, you know, they go buy a ranch in Montana. They'll go, you know. And I think that's helpful for their process to, to be in touch with real life and real people, especially for an actor, you know. Um, so I admire that. I do.